Hey everyone, welcome to our podcast, Over the Hill. We're Joy and Jason, and we're amateur cyclists on our quest to become the best version of ourselves while riding our bike. We also have a YouTube channel called Joy and Jason Rides, which is a visual recap of our races and events. Sometimes we can't really go in depth with our experiences in our videos, so hopefully this podcast can fill the gap. In this episode, we'll share our opinions on the latest Tour de France, the Olympics, and Leadville 100 mountain bike race. Jason will also reveal something that he's been struggling with, which is his bike handling skills. Lastly, excuse the background noise, our dog Rudy has had a long day and you'll catch him snoring in the background. So sit tight and enjoy the episode. Okay guys, so it's been a while since we've recorded a podcast and uh, I know we're a little behind, so hopefully we can catch you guys up um, in this within an hour or so. So I guess maybe we should talk about just some of the things that we've been doing for training and reactions to some current events in the cycling world, like the Tour de France, the men's Tour de France, the Olympics, and maybe a little bit of Leadville. So for for training, um, now I'm trying to remember the last the last podcast that we did was after which event was it? Um, this was, um, I believe, it was the Vermont Fondo. Okay, so we've decided to focus our training for the rest of this summer on the Mount Greylock hill climb time trial which is the first weekend in September um, so we're we're not doing any other races until then um, so our training has really been focused on building general fitness and you know starting to do um, specific efforts and intervals that will prepare us for that event so we also did the tour of Litchfield Hills um, two weeks ago, which is which was a training ride that we did uh, to prep us for Greylock. And the video, hopefully, it's about 50% done, and hopefully it'll be out before this podcast comes out so you guys can get an idea of how we used tour of Litchfield Hills as a good training for, for Greylock. And um, pretty much after Tour of Litchfield Hills, which was two weeks ago, we also did a couple of hard workouts to gear up for this. And last week, so this is our recovery week now, and last week after, well, Sunday, um, well, really it was after Saturday, you know, we were pretty much trashed after that. And it was really hard to get up in the morning to even do a four hour endurance ride, but somehow we got it done. And uh, yeah, we did a, on Saturday, we did a three by 15 at Threshold on Skiff Mountain Road, which is in Kent, not too far from Macedonia. And we used this road as training last year also for Greylock and I'm going to say it's about three to four miles and it's a, I don't remember what the first mile was, the average grade, but it was, it's pretty steep. Yeah. I want to say the first mile is 9% average grade, but I, I could be wrong on that. But the first mile is pretty steep and then it it's kind of gradual rolling after that, which is actually pretty similar to Greylock profile. So skiff mountain is is kind of a mini version of Greylock. it's almost like doing one third of Greylock. so it's actually a a perfect training ground it's the best training ground that we have nearby to to simulate what we're going to face at Greylock. and we've done three by 15 workouts before this is actually my third time doing this workout and I felt okay in the last two that I did it, but this time around, it was like really hard for me to put out my power. And um, I was able to hit the targets, but 
I was working really hard to hit them. And I actually like PR'd my five minute, 10 minute heart rate for this year, just doing that workout. And part of the reason I think may be that it's pretty steep. And I think my, just the muscles were starting to get tired after the second set. And um, it was just playing games in my head. And I know that I had this small range uh, of power to target, uh, to stay within that target, um, or stay within that range, I mean. And it was just, um, it. I think it was like just mentally exhausting just to keep looking at my head unit and making sure that I wasn't going too hard. Um, our coach specifically said just stay, stay within the range to, to get the benefits of it and not to go too hard on it. So I think that was really what like was a mental uh, drain for me, just making sure that I'm within my, my range. Yeah, for me, it was mainly the steepness of that first mile and the fact that I haven't really been doing much low cadence work um, this year, which kind of started with when I had a, a knee injury after the high point time trial, a lot of my workouts were, were high cadence and, you know, that was on purpose to, you know, to take pressure off the knee. And then I, I kind of liked it. I became used to, to doing the high, higher cadence. And so that became my preferred cadence started becoming, you know, 90 plus, or, you know, maybe upper eighties, you know, is fine also, but it's really been a while since I tried to, to push threshold power at 60 to 70 RPMs which is what you have to do on at least for us with our where our thresholds are at on that first mile of skiff we end up doing you know 60 to 70 rpms on those steep sections and that that was really hitting my legs hard and um you know first two sets were okay but then by the on the third set by the time i got to the end of the steep section my legs were were cooked so um but I'm looking forward to doing more workouts on skiff because I know that it's necessary to work those, um, to work the muscles in, in that different way with, you know, a little bit of grinding. It's necessary to have that in our toolbox for, for Greylock because we're going to, to have to do some of that, um, at Greylock. So kind of off topic but if you guys hear the snoring our dog Rudy is near us and he's he's just taking his nap is one of his many naps and he's snoring so if you hear that in the background or if you hear uh just sounds like pitter pattering it's Rudy just walking around so he can't be not he can't not be part of the podcast so he's here he's making an appearance um I guess uh, I just want to um, I kind of glossed over this, but uh, tour of Litchfield Hills real quick. Did you want to say anything about how just quickly about the event? Um, yeah, so it's a it's a charity event and um, we have more information in our, our YouTube video specifically of the um, the cause and how you can, you know, if you're interested, how you can uh, can can donate to the cause um behind it but uh it's it was a very well run event um very well supported we were kind of surprised you know given given that it's a you know a charity focused event and, and not necessarily for profit um you know the the entry fee was was pretty it was very reasonable given um everything that they provided and uh, you know, the the route itself worked out great for us um, in terms of a training ride, because there were some some longer climbs where we were able to do uh, 
you know, 15, 20 minutes at threshold or, you know, 30 minutes at tempo, some climbs that we don't have around near where we live, um, to do those longer efforts and to do some of those longer tempo or threshold efforts as part of a, as part of a 75 mile ride, you know, was a very good training stimulus and a fun way to get that stimulus. Yeah, to add to the um, whole very well-run event, uh, I do highly uh, suggest that or highly recommend that if anybody is in the area to do the event because, yes, um, I was just kind of surprised by how, by how well it was run and the aid stations were well-stocked. We only stopped at one aid station, but... For this 75 mile course, there were four aid stations, which I was surprised of. And one of the aid stations that we stopped at was like fully stocked with scratch products, with water, like, and they had, they provided ice. And it was just like a really, it was just really nice. And um, just like, I, I was just amazed by how well it was run and um, afterwards we had like pizza, they had like, you know, just simple stuff, but, um, for the price that you pay, um, and how well it was run, I would highly encourage you to, to participate in it. Um, and obviously it is for a great cause. It's for, um, raising funds for cancer research and for, um, those who are affected by, by cancer. So, yeah. Um, anything else that you wanted to add to the training that we did? No, I think we can move on to current events. Yeah. Yeah. Current events. So we just got done, uh, well, a few weeks ago was the tour de France and that ended. What did you think of it? Well, it was, um, it wasn't as fun to watch as last year's where um although when we when we watched the unchained documentary uh about the 2023 tour i actually had forgotten how much jonas beat tade by in that one it kind of water I think I'm okay. Um, so for some reason, when we were watching the tour, the 2023 tour, it seemed like it was a close battle, but then between Jonas and Tade, but it actually really wasn't. Um, so it was, it was kind of the reverse of what happened this year. Uh, but, but still I, I, I think I wanted to see a little bit of a battle between Jonas and, and Tade. There were a few stages where um, there was a, a close battle where they sprinted to, for a finish. And um, I, I don't remember what stage that was where uh, Jonas um, beat Tade, won the stage but used by a sprint. And it was like, I don't know, it was a second that he won. But um, overall, I think it was uh, to win for Tade to win right from stage four, the yellow jersey and had held the yellow jersey towards the end is pretty impressive. But I agree. I don't think we watched it very much just because it was such a dominant performance by Tade that it wasn't as exciting to watch as last year's tour. And uh, we, it was almost like, you know, we all knew who was going to win. Um, but in addition to that, I think it was also um, impressive from Jonas's standpoint, from recovering from that crash. Um, I believe it was tour of Bass Country. And uh, he had to recover from that and obviously didn't train as well as he'd hoped. And I'm sure Jason knows what, how it feels like to be to crash out of a race and not 
train properly for the upcoming events. But, you know, we're not, we're not Tour de France, right? We're not world tour riders. But it's, you know, it's, it's very, you kind of relate to it in a human, uh, you know, just like, you can relate to it because everybody's human and everybody has experienced crashes that could deter their training. And I thought it was pretty impressive that he, you know, he still hang hung on there. Jonas, I mean, he hung on for second place by being down. I believe he finished um, in three, some three minutes and something seconds. And uh, Remco was behind a total of six minutes from Tade. So yeah, I mean, it was, I think there was a couple of impressive things that had happened at the tour. Yeah, I mean, I think for Jonas to even be able to to do the tour, I think was, uh, was pretty amazing. And to come in second without having proper training going into it you know just shows you how shows you how fit he is that he was able to still podium with you know less than his a game and then the other thing that kind of surprised me about the tour was Remco's performance I didn't expect him to to podium on the GC um yeah, you know, I I always knew he was a great time trialist, um, but up until then, up until this year's tour, I hadn't really seen him uh, hang with the you know the best climbers, you know, on the GC, you know, on these um, these high elevation long climbs that they do. I didn't realize that he had that kind of ability to to hang with with Jonas and Tade on on those kind of climbs, and and you know you could say well he didn't hang with them because you know he finished a little bit behind them, but he still beat pretty much everyone else on those climbs. Yeah, and this was his first tour, uh, so you know it's it's I know that in previous races that he's um, done with. Jonas and Tade, he struggled a bit on the elevation, um, climbs that would go up in elevation. And I think, you know, he always dropped. And I think a lot of people, from what I read, is that he has a lot of um, pressure from his Belgian fans. And um, they either, you know, love him or hate him. And I think he has a lot of pressure on him. So for him to hang on for the third place and win two gold medals at the Olympics is another impressive feat. Anything to add on that? Yeah, well, he must have, I mean, the only explanation I have for his performance at the Olympics is that he must have been riding a wave of, uh, he must have gotten a, a big, boost in fitness from doing the tour and then somehow recovered enough from that to be ready to do a couple of races in the Olympics as he he must have been riding a a wave of great fitness and um but he also had to have nailed his his preparation for the Olympics in terms of recovery and everything because um you know he you wouldn't have known he must have been you know really fatigued after the tour but you wouldn't have known that by just looking at him at the olympics one of the things that um i had a discussion with jason's dad at the dinner table and he asked about the flat that remco got on the last three k's of the race like he was in he entered the Louvre and every, and the commentators uh, said, "Oh, he's already celebrating with three Ks left to go." And it wasn't because he was celebrating; he was it was because he had a flat. And I read from the an article that he was running inner tubes, and I didn't get to finish reading the article. And uh, and my father in law was pretty much like, "I can't believe he got a new bike. They don't even change the rear wheel." And I'm thinking like, yeah, I don't think there's any time for it. It's probably a lot faster to to swap out the bike 
um, than change the rear wheel. But anyway, I was actually, when I read this article, um, I remember reading he was running inner tubes. And I had this, you know, I was trying to explain to them that, you know, there's, you know, we have tubeless sealants now. We have, um, you know, when you puncture, you can continue to ride with a puncture and it will eventually seal <clears throat> as what's, um, as what happened uh, to Jason and I. Uh, Jason punctured at tour Litchfield Hills and I punctured my front tire the day after that or a couple of days after that and it's sealed on its own. So I'm always surprised as to how teams um, or, P or individuals decide to run their equipment because with the advent of tubeless tires and um, how what an advantage you have like you you would think that if you get a, a puncture it's probably better to run tubeless so that way you can just continue riding and not have to worry about swapping out bikes because Remco's reaction when he did get a puncture I mean he was panicking um, and rightfully so because he was close to getting the gold and they don't have any radios to tell them how far ahead they were from the rest he was from the rest of the the pack but uh, yeah, it's always like a, you know, if anybody knows why he ran inner tubes as opposed to to uh, tubeless, you know, you could leave a comment or, yeah, leave a comment. Do you know if, if certain kinds of tubes have lower rolling resistance than tubeless? Yeah, or? I mean, there's the latex, latex tubes, which have lower rolling resistance than tubeless from what I read, um, some research on it. But I would think still, though, because they were riding on cobbles, you know, that's like they ride on cobbles in a couple of different, you know, the Belgian classics. Like you would think, even Perry roubaix you know, there's cobbles. And you would think that, you know, it's probably not a good idea to, and I don't know how, I don't know how um, serious those cobbles are uh, that they rode on uh, at the, Olympics, but I know I would think if you're, you know, if your bike is jostling around, um, you know, there's a higher propensity for it to, to puncture. But anyway, it doesn't matter because he still won it. <laughs> and for the women's, um, this was the time trial. Um, I was happy to see Chloe Digert, uh get bronze and that. It's been a long waiting game to see her um, out there performing. And I know that she's been, you know, going through a lot, health complications, the crash that um, really tore up her, uh, her, her, her thigh there. Um, so I was happy to see Chloe getting bronze in the road race, or not road race, the time trial. Um, and kind of bummed to see uh, Taylor Nib. We uh, we follow uh, triathlon also. Well, I tend to listen to a lot of triathlon podcasts and watch triathlon content also on YouTube. And uh, yeah, kind of a bummer to see Taylor struggle through that um, through that course. And it was, you know, it's probably not the best course for her as a triathlete because it's different from like road time trials are different from triathlons, uh, a triathlon bike segment. So yeah, kind of a bummer to see her crash and uh, a few times in the wet roads, but hopefully, you know, she has learned from that and she's still an incredible athlete. Um, so, you know, she did earn that spot. Um, beating Kristen Faulkner on the uh, national TT champs. But yeah, that's a time trial and the road race totally um, surprised me. And part of the reason why I was surprised by that is because I thought, I, I thought maybe um, it was Voss and Voss uh, and the front and, Kristen Faulkner and Lada Kapecki were chasing and it looked as though 
Kopecky was seriously hurting. Um, and I don't know, I don't watch Kopecky race all that often, but it looked like her, bo- her upper body was like, was moving around a lot. And so that usually to me indicates that, you know, people are tired. And so she must have been tired. And I thought, I remember getting close to the end of the race and I asked Jason, like, oh, I wonder when, uh, I wonder, because I, I knew ahead of time that Kristen won. I just didn't know how she won it. So that's when I asked Jason, like, oh, I wonder how she, she gets this win. And she pretty much just rode off from them. And it was, and the three other women just sat up. Um, and it's probably because, you know, it, they, they were tired. and But I was surprised that none of them got to her wheel because they are three pretty good sprinters, a lot better sprinter than Kristen did. And I would think hop on their wheel strategically and um, sprint it out for first, second, and third. But I guess they decided at that moment to just let her go and just look at each other. Yeah, I always kind of like it when a non-sprinter wins a race just because I can relate to not being a sprinter not that I can relate to winning a race but you know I'm I'm not a good sprinter myself so um I always kind of root for the people that don't have a good sprint and when they're able to attack at the end of a race and just stay away from everyone else just you know doing like a longer effort um you know I I always root for them and you know I'm uh you know, that's, I'm impressed by their ability to do that. And so. And yeah, that doesn't, you know, take away from how, what an incredible athlete Kristen is. And I was really happy to see her win because I watched her, I think it was Stradibianchi. I watched her go off in the front and Kapeki and Demi Vollering were chasing her. And she almost won it, but, you know, they obviously caught her in the really steep cobbled climb there. Uh, this was, I believe, the race where uh, Demi had yelled, I'd screamed at Lottie for the sprint. Um, anyway, uh, so that really showed me, it's like, oh, wow, she's a, you know, she, she's got something. Unfortunately, she was disqualified from that race because she was wearing a glucose monitor or a continuous glucose machine. So, um, and then you're, it's like one of those super sapiens uh, things. And apparently that's not allowed in racing. So yeah, she was disqualified from that, but she would have gotten third. And it kind of showed me how, you know, what an incredible athlete she was then. And to see her win it was really awesome. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the race there, to me, she looked like the strongest woman amongst several others who are, you know, more more well-known or, you know, have have more race wins. And so you would think that on paper she she wouldn't have been the strongest, but she looked the strongest when you actually watched the race. And not only did I liked the way she won the race but i loved the way she finished it in particular where she didn't celebrate at all like she crosses the line still like she's still pedaling hard like after the finish line (laughs) it's like no celebration whatsoever until she until she eventually came to a stop and you know probably realized she won and then you know, then she was obviously happy and celebrating, but there was like no premature celebration, no, you know, posting up crossing the finish line or anything. Like I like that kind of attitude where it's just, you know, go all out until, until the race is over and just make sure you win it. Yeah. I uh, was listening to the Bonk Bros podcast. Um, They were commenting on, on that uh, non-celebration uh, on her win and I believe it was Scott McGill who said that uh, she, he was like if she can't hold her hand up is she like not good with ha- her bike handling or something like along the lines of that and uh, I think just from seeing a couple of faux pas in recent races this year in the women's side 
with early celebrations. I think she was just being extra cautious. And I believe it was last, the, the last Olympics, um, Anna Kiesenhofer, this is for the road race, um, the Dutch women were um, rallying for uh, Annemiek van Leuten to, to win. And they didn't realize that Annie, Anna Kiesenhofer was in the front because there were no radios. And I remember Anna Meek did a huge, cel- you know, celebrated, you know, thinking she won and then realized that she actually came in second place. And yeah, and I think in the recent races this year, you know, with I think Lorena Wiebus did a celebration. I believe there was another rider that celebrated early in the SD Works team. And it's it's kind of, um, sometimes it's a little strange because in these races, not the Olympic road race, but the races they have throughout the year, they have radios. So it's odd that, um, you know, it's, it's odd that they would celebrate early. And so I'm glad that she didn't. I think I agree with Jason that he or sh- that Kristen, I think, did it right and make sure that she she secured the, the gold medal before actually celebrating. And she did celebrate afterwards. And when she had the, the flag up and everything, we don't need <laughs> we don't need a Remco celebration where he gets out of the bike and holds it. It was just a great shot. But I think, you know, I I think it's just, it's better to just celebrate afterwards. Agreed. Um, And then she went on to win with the team, the team pursuit. Uh, They went on to win the the gold medal. So um, Kristen Faulkner also won the gold medal in team pursuit, which was, it's really cool. I mean, it's really awesome to, to know that um, I don't know. I just think that there's not a whole lot of female American, uh, American female cyclists in the world tour. I know Corinne Lebecki just retired. Um, but she's one of the very few people, you know, few women in the world tour team. And so it's nice to be able to see, it's exciting to see, um, you know, exciting to see them take the gold. Um, so I guess we can also talk about Leadville because Leadville was this past weekend. I don't know. Did you have anything? Um, I don't, I don't have too much to say about Leadville other than that, you know, there's a lot of like equipment, unique equipment. Well, I yeah. should say unique, but there were definitely a lot of equipment choices that, um, got to go credit, got to give credit to Dylan Johnson for starting this. Um, so if you guys don't follow uh, gravel, Keegan Swenson is pretty dominant in the gravel sector. And um, last year, Dylan Johnson uh, rode his bike. He had drop bar. He had a drop bar mountain bike. And he was going to go and do it again this year, optimizing it to, you know, further optimizing his setup. And so Keegan Swenson, and I, I'm not sure who else did drop bar mountain bike, but Keegan Swenson did it and he broke his own record um, by finishing it in five hours and 49 seconds. Uh, and it's a hundred mile bike race with over 11,000 feet of gain mountain bike you know this is like a mountain bike course so which is crazy i was looking at and i appreciate athletes um who post their power numbers and he did do you remember how what it was his average power was like 279 or something yeah i think i think it was something like that and um I can't remember why I brought that and, up. And that's at altitude. Yes, that's at altitude. So it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty, oh yeah, he, he, I think last year they said that his descent, he maxed out at 50 miles per hour descending one of the, I think it was power line climb, which is insane on a mountain bike. Oh yeah, and his, his speed this year was 17, 
miles, I believe is 17.4. I could be wrong, but it's around 17 miles per hour, which is super fast for a mountain bike course. I know that there was a few road sections to connect the, um, to connect the trail, but it's a really impressive. And to think that, you know, sub nine hours finishing that, finishing it in sub nine hours, what did Trader Road say? That in order to finish it in less than nine hours, you would need to do, I think, I think they said 2.7 watts per kilo, um, which translates into 3.2 watts per kilo at sea level. So that's like, that's like mind blowing for, to me, like, you know, I, I, I could maybe do three, 3.2 watts per kilo for like one hour. <laughs> Um, so you have to even, someone like me has no shot of even finishing Leadville in, in less than nine hours and, and Keegan did it in less than six hours. So it's just crazy. And the most mind blowing thing is that, uh, Rich Froning, if you guys follow CrossFit, you know, he's like the world's fittest man, Rich Froning did Leadville last year. Oh, he didn't do it this year. Did he? Um, I thought he said I'm he was going to sure. do it this year. I thought he said he was going to do it this year and without trying to go for, you know, the, oh, the just time to enjoy goal, it, yeah. he was going to like do it to try to actually enjoy it. But yeah, Rich Froning last year finished sub nine, which is insane. If you've ever seen this guy, I mean, this just tells you how fit he is, aerobically fit he is to be to finish sub nine because you get this big belt buckle and that's all he wanted was the big belt buckle. And this guy is like muscles, like he's got unnecessary upper body strength for cycling. And to, for him to finish it in sub nine is a, is pretty cool. Yeah. So going back to the watts per kilo requirement there, that's, that's the first thing I thought about when I heard that podcast, Trainer Road podcast, talking about, you know, how many watts per kilo you would need to do to finish in a certain time. And when I heard that about the finishing sub nine, the first thing that came to my mind was, man, Rich Froning did, you know, over equivalent of over 3.2 watts per kilo at sea level. And he's not even a cyclist. Uh, for, for nine hours, for almost nine hours, he does over three watts per kilo and he's not even a cyclist. That just shows you how fit he is. So for the women, I wanted um, Sofia Vila Vichafanye. No, Sofia, Sofia Gomez Vichafanye. I don't know why I said Vila. Uh, she won it a couple of times. She won it last year, and I think, I'm not sure if she won it the year before, but I kind of wanted her to win because I know that um, she struggled a bit in Unbound, um, just like Keegan did. And so I was, I favored her to win. She was basically the favorite, but um, she got second place. Um, and the woman who won it, her name is Melissa Rollins. And Dylan Johnson in the Bonk Pros podcast also, um, he actually predicted her win. And so he's been, he's been correct for a few different reasons. So yeah, yeah. Um, She's on the same team. She's uh, on Virginia Blue Ridge 2024 team, which is the same team. This is their gravel um, team, but basically overall same team as Kristen Kolchinski, who is the hill climber. So fun fact. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, with current events and training, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to add to that, but if there isn't, we can move on to um, our segment on Jason's back to working on his skills. Yeah, or it's more like I'm working on my skills for the first time, which is long overdue. Um, so the reason behind this is going back to when I crashed out at the Mine Hill race, that it was a fairly hard crash, you know, that I had some 
had like a you know hip injury from and also some pretty bad road rash and the the nature of that of where i crashed it was a kind of a a, a slight downhill tight right turn from a, a gravel road onto a paved road and i've never really been um I've never been the best bike handler in general and, you know, partly because I don't think I ever really spent time working on focusing on skills. Um, I was always too focused on, you know, building fitness and kind of neglected handling. Uh, but anyway, not the greatest bike handler to begin with. And for whatever reason, I've always found it more difficult to make right hand turns than left hand turns if they're, you know, if they're, um, relatively sharp turns. Um, I've never really had a problem turning left, but I've always kind of struggled to turn right with the same, you know, smoothness. Uh, so I don't know if that was part of the reason why I crashed at mine Hill, but in any event, after that happened, I've had this mental block where, or like fear of making sharp right turns. And it's, it's sort of followed me around on pretty much every ride that I've done since that event. Um, whenever I come upon a sharp right turn, especially if it's downhill, I kind of freeze. I get scared and I, I, have sort of like a flashback to what it felt like to crash and I I just kind of freeze up and you know obviously when you uh when your body stiffens up it it makes it harder for the bike for you to to lean the bike you know the the way you need to in order to to make a corner um so I've really been struggling with with right hand turns, um, ever since then, you know, even more so than, than before the crash. And it's become, become a, you know, pretty big issue because it's become kind of a safety issue. It's like, I, um, you know, I got to the point where, you know, I, I couldn't do, you know, a, I couldn't do a ride without having this, a ride of any sort without having this fear pop in at some point. Yeah, I think he somehow decided that, you know, he'd use certain parts of the road as, um, what did you call it? Like a fail safe area or like a, I forget what that term was that you used. When you're when you can't make the full right turn and you end up just going into the grass onto the other side of the road. Oh yeah, I mean there were a few times where, so like for example, when most pretty much every ride that we do, where where we ride, if we do we're doing a road ride from our house, when we're on our way home, the the making the turn onto our street is is you know a right hand corner slightly downhill. It's not like a full, uh, it's a pretty sharp turn. It's not a full hair, it's not like a hairpin, but it's almost a hairpin where, you know, it's it's more than a right angle turn. It's like you turn right and then you swoop or keep swooping around. And a couple times, um, you know, we were riding home and I froze up making this, as I started to make that turn, onto our street, um, I would freeze up and it's like, I couldn't, I just felt like my body wouldn't turn to the right. And I end up pretty much bailing out, going straight ahead into the grass on the other side of the road. Um, which fortunately was okay at the time because there were, there was no car in the other lane, but obviously if there were a car coming, uh, a car on, on the, on the road coming the other way on that side of the road, it, there would have been a big problem. So, um, so that kind of prompted me to, to say, you know what, I need to, I need to do something about this. I need to address it because it's becoming 
like a safety issue at this point. Um, so how am I, what am I doing to address it? Um, I'm really just kind of going back to basics and I've decided to, to devote some time specifically to, um, to bike handling. And lately my, the main focus of this training has been on making the, the, the right hand turns. Uh, but there's a few other things I've thrown in there as well. Um, so what I've been doing is usually if I, if I'm doing a recovery ride, um, I used to always do recovery rides on the trainer just to, to make sure that I could stay in zone one, but there's, um, a loop around our neighborhood. That's, um, it's kind of hilly, but with the gearing that we have, I can stay mostly in zone one with a little bit of crossover into zone two on some of the hills. Um, so I've been using this loop for my recovery rides, um, in the summer and I'll usually do, you know, 30 minute, uh, recovery ride. And then I'll spend another 30 minutes where I just, I pull into a, uh, this church parking lot, um, along the way. And it has, the parking lot has a, an island in the middle of it. So it's kind of, it creates kind of a hairpin turn depending it could be either left or right, depending on which way, which side of the island you approach it on. Uh, so I've been using that to practice, you know, really tight right hand turns. And that's helped, that's helped in terms of just drilling the mechanics, um, into my brain of how to, how to lean the bike and, um, you know, stick the right knee out, uh, put my weight through the, uh, the left pedal, you know, straighten the left leg, putting my, my weight on the, um, on the left side, uh, foot and, uh, and leaning the bike to the right and, you know, just kind of feathering the brakes, approaching the turn, then letting go of the brakes, going around the turn and just let the bike, you know, do what it needs to do. And, um, the, the thing that I've found to be the most important, uh, is not even so much the mechanics of it, but for me, the most important thing is to, to focus my vision on, uh, on the road ahead where I want the bike to go. Yeah. I think you, you had also had an incident at the tour of Litchfield, right? When you made that right turn. And I remember you made a comment about how somebody was on your line. And so you couldn't really take the line that you wanted. Um, and I think I remembered saying to you, well, don't focus on a line on the road. You really need to be focusing ahead because it's not like it's a single track. You know, I can, t I can understand why, you know, you would be focusing on what line to take on a single track, but on a road you have, you know, it's pretty, it's obviously more than a single track and it's wide enough where you can just look ahead instead of looking at the ground. Yeah, so... So I'm still, tr this is still a work in progress. I've had some productive training sessions, you know, riding in, in a parking lot, like I said, but also, um, also thinking about some of these things when I, when I'm out on the road on the couple of the routes that you know, I do my endurance rides on nearby our house, you know, there's a few right hand turns where I can get some, you know, quote, real life practice with this. And, um, I've definitely noticed that it makes a huge difference if I can just get myself to, to look ahead and look where I want the bike to go. It, it tends to just follow my vision. You know, the, the bike will just lean enough in that direction, my body will tend to turn in that direction. 
Um, so I don't have to think quite as much about mechanics if I just focus on, you know, where I want to go. Yeah, it's really hard to talk about what to do with your body. Um, you know, try to, I've tried a few times to sort of give Jason advice on how he should position his body, you know, putting a little bit of weight on the, um, your shoulder and how you should, um, almost like not shrug your left shoulder when you're making a right turn, but bringing that arm up or bringing, yeah, bringing the arm up and lowering the right arm down so that you're really leaning. You can lean the bike and, um, you're not leaning your body, but it's just more of your arm that's leaning it. It's hard to talk about that. Um, because it's really technical. It's almost like trying to hit the driver, you know, in golf. Like when you're, when Jason was showing me, cause he played golf in high school, he showed me how to hit the golf ball with the driver and how you should do this with your arm and don't forget to rotate your wrist so that the ball doesn't curve to the right. Like I always hit the, when I used to hit the ball with the driver and it's, I, the ball would um, fly and it would go straight. It would go to the right. It's so it's almost like I'm trying to like understand it better um, through his perspective because the body, I'm, I, I, I'm pretty, I consider, I call it a dynamic cyclist. I call myself pretty dynamic on the bike. Like I'm pretty comfortable with moving my body in different directions and I'm just pretty comfortable with the bike handling aspect. And so for me to give him to talk about how you should do, how he should position his body and where, what he should do with his eyes. It's, it's really hard. I think it's just like, sometimes it's a little bit too much information and this, um, this cornering thing, uh, or turning thing, it was, I know in, in mountain biking, you had, issues with turning right but that's like because you have to really make a, a really tight right turn because there's a tree around there and you have to go around the tree um but in in road cycling it's like you know i i barely noticed anything that was you know that really was like a red flag when we ride on the road prior to this crash and now it's like gotten to be a little concerning because it is a safety issue, especially when you're riding on the road and you're making a right turn and there's a car coming in the opposite direction and you obviously don't want to hit the car. So I guess the most simplest thing that I could say is that just focus on the road ahead. And if there's a car coming, don't look at that car. Obviously, just know, use your peripheral vision to know that there's a car there, but focus on where you want to go instead of focusing on what you want to avoid. Because if you're looking at what you're going to avoid, you're going to get, you know, you're, you're going to go towards it. Yeah, this actually happened. Uh, one of those time, one of the times when we were coming home from a ride, we were turning onto our street and there actually was a car in, um, in the other lane. It was, it was kind of waiting at the stop sign at the end of our street. So it was, um, at least it wasn't moving, but it was sort of like in my, my bailout zone. So as I was making that turn, I got kind of scared because I was like, I, I felt the pressure because I was like, I have to do it right this time because there's no bailout. Um, but fortunately I, I managed to, to, to do it successfully that time by when I saw that the car there, I was like, okay, just feather the brakes, just slow yourself down enough so that, you know, you're, you're comfortable with your speed going into the turn. And then as I started the turn, I was like, just look as far to the, your right as possible. Just keep looking over your right shoulder is kind of what I was thinking. Um, and yeah, it worked. I mean, it, you know, I was able to, to swing the bike around the, the turn and stay in my lane. So, um, yeah, I think for now that's the main thought that I'm that I'm 
keeping in my head because it's uh you know part of the 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 main the main problem that that I have is with this issue is that it's it's all in my head um you know it's it's fear based and um it's not like I've never made like I said, I'd never been like great at bike handling, but before the the crash, I was able to make right hand turns without thinking about it too much. Aside from, aside from being like slightly less comfortable doing it than, I've always been slightly less comfortable turning right than left. It just always felt like a little more awkward to me. Um, but I never thought, I was never afraid of it before. Um, so now, you know, th this fear has, has gotten into my head and it's, uh, it's almost like my body forgot, like how to turn the bike, you know, how to, how to make the turn. It's like the fear just takes over and the body freezes up. So I just have to, you know, I'm, 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 I'm working to get past that. And, um, yeah, the, the, the main tip so far that's worked the best is just to, to make sure you look, if you're turning right, make sure you're, you're looking to the right and looking up ahead at the road ahead where you want the bike to end up going. Um, and you know, that's, that's been my main key. Um, so there's a few other, you know, the, the right hand cornering is the main thing that I've been practicing, but there's, you know, there's, um, a few other skills that I need to sharpen up also. And, I won't spend too much time, you know, talking about what, talking about that, but I'll just mention that, um, I want to ha have the ability to unclip and clip back in with either foot, um, you know, so that I can just be more versatile. Um, I'm used to, uh, normally I unclip with the left foot and, you know, push off with when I'm starting up again starting up, I push off with the right foot and clip in with the left. Um, so I've been practicing doing the opposite, um, just so that I can get, I want to get to the point where I'm comfortable doing it either way, just in case, cause you never know, you know, what situation could come up where it may make more sense to unclip with one foot or the other. It may make sense to maybe try that on the trainer practice clipping and unclipping, you know, practice the speed at which you clip and unclip on a trainer. That way it's safer and you're not going to fall. And then gradually practice that outside. I think it's definitely more challenging to practice outside because once the bike is moving, it's like a little harder and you've got maybe the terrain is going up or there's a car coming. But I think it'll be it'd be good to also to practice that on a trainer and just say that way you have, you know, the that way you have that muscle memory. Yeah, I mean for for me the the adversity to um or the, the avoidance of unclipping with my right foot was more of a more of a balance issue than um I think it all stemmed back from when I, I started riding, um, when we first started riding, I was coming off of a, a knee surgery on my right knee. So I was kind of favoring my left leg at the time. And I just kind of got into that habit of, it's almost like the left leg became my dominant leg. Um, so so for me, the, the, the main issue with unclipping with the right foot has been more of a balance thing where I just feel like I'm, I'm kind of like, um, awkward, uh, you know, I don't have a, like I could easily do the motion of unclipping, but it's like putting, it's more like putting the foot down with the, the right foot is what I'm not used to doing. So that's, that's the thing that I'm practicing. I remembered you went, I believe it was a neurologist. I'm not sure if it was a neurologist where you had that, you know, the dizziness, the dizzy spells. And remember they had 
diagnosed you with proprioception. I don't remember what the term was, but you had to pretty much do these exercises where you're on the, you know, you're at the door frame and you are, you're holding one leg up. You had one leg up and the other, the one foot up, one foot on the ground and balance with one foot. And your balance was, was that, I don't know if it was good or you struggled with it. Um, well, my balance is okay. If I, if I close my eyes, my balance goes out the window. If I, like if, if I'm not, my balance is okay on one foot. If I'm, if I have my eyes open and I'm looking ahead, but, um, if I try to like stand on one foot with my eyes closed, I don't think I can do it with either foot. Yeah, so it must be hard. Obviously, you're not riding your bike with that with your eyes closed, but it must be hard. I don't know what that's like because I don't have a balance issue. But what must be hard to um, to do, you know, to unclip or to have that. I know you struggle with clipping in when we're stop at a stop sign or a stoplight. And I could always hear you like, like you're, you're full of feeling around your foot and eventually it does clip in. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it could be that you're, you know, you've, you're afraid that you might lose balance or something. That's why you struggle with it. I don't know. I think my struggle to clip in is like, I try to do it too, too fast and like, I need to just slow down and like, you know, just push off with one foot and, and just kind of let the bike coast for a second so that I can like slowly place my other foot on the pedal and, you know, and, and put and, and clip it in. Uh, cause sometimes if you, if you try to do it too fast, the pedal like starts spinning yeah, and then that makes it like harder to, once the pedal like spins like that, then it's almost like pure luck if you can actually like land your foot on the proper side of the pedal. Well, when I, when we're stop, either a stop sign or stop light, it's not a hundred percent that I can get my, my right foot clipped in right away. Once we get going, there are times when I can't clip it in and I just pedal anyway, because your, your foot will st- stay somewhat on the pedal if you just keep pedaling and then you know you can clip in afterwards once you're a little bit you know once you're you're you know get through the road and you calm down a little bit i don't know if you've ever tried that with just oh yeah pedaling i I, I do that a lot yeah without clipping in all the way and then eventually clip in oh yeah i do that a lot where just to get through the the intersection I'm pedaling on the the wrong like my my foot is touching the wrong side of the pedal cuz mm-hmm. it's the pedal's facing down and I just you know pedal through the intersection until I can get to a safe spot to you know to to properly clip in So is there anything else that you wanted to discuss on that matter your skills um well i guess i'll just touch a little bit on descending which is not something that i've been practicing specifically um because you know it's it's kind of it's a lot easier to do repetitions of a a right turn when you're just in a parking lot in a small area but to actually you know do do it on a on a real descent um is you know a, a little hard to find the the road and terrain for that um but i've just sort of picked joy's brain on a few tips for descending because she's she's pretty good at descending um and has always she's always been a faster descender than me um even when even before i was um you know i had this handling issue um 
so I just kind of picked her brain on um, how she does it and a few of the tips that she's given me that seem to work well that um, I wasn't thinking about before was um, getting your weight back. Uh, so heading into, uh, especially when you're heading into a turn uh, to help slow yourself down, there's a couple of things. Heading into a turn um, to get your first get get your weight back so like maybe push your butt a little further back on the saddle um and feather the front brake uh to because the the front brake will st stop you faster than the rear brake um but it's also a little dangerous like you, you don't want to like jerk the front brake because then especially if your weight is not back because then you know you'll go flying over the the handlebars um, but if you get your weight back then uh, you know you can do it safely and it it kind of modulates your speed going into the turn and you know that that helps me because I, you know, I can sort of if I can slow myself down going into the turn to a point where I I feel like I'm I'm comfortable and I'm ready to make the turn now then I can just let go of the brakes and you know look look ahead where i want to go and just lean the bike and let it let it um you know curve around around the turn yeah there's always something graceful i find with people who can descend well just watching how they move their bodies and how they read the roads it's um pretty neat to to be able to to see to witness some uh you know some individuals who are really good at descending can can do that so well one of the things that i learned how i learned to descend is by watching safa s-a-f-a -A, safa brian on youtube and he's done a lot of descending videos and some of them, like, I can't, I definitely don't think I can do that. But just watching how their bodies are positioned on the bike, what they do with their knee, like sticking out their knee when they're making a left turn or a right turn and mimicking those movements. I found all the, all the training rides that we've done, I've been like practicing, you know, I always use the training rides as practice different skills. And just by practicing that, I found that, oh, yeah, it does work well when you're leaning, when you're sticking your, your left knee or right knee out, depending on what direction you want to go and really leaning that bike. And minimizing the amount of times you're braking on a descent, because once you learn how to move your body on the bike descending, you can really get a good speed without too much braking. You obviously have to brake in some in corners, but just minimizing that braking and letting your body just, or letting the bike go and just moving your body in certain ways. It's, um, it's amazing how much speed you can gain on a descent. Um, you know, when you, when you do that, and it's also that I call, you know, they, they call it in, in, in mountain biking, the flow state. It's like, you're so like in the zone that you just, your body, you just let your body do its thing. And it's, it's hard to, and I know that there are, um, people who struggle with descending and, you know, it's almost like, it's one of those things that cornering, descending, all these skills, it's like, it's so hard to, to teach and it's so hard to it's hard to learn it if you struggle with how your body is on the bike yeah i think that's i think i'm one of those people that um handling the bike has never been uh has never come easily to me i've never really been graceful on the bike um, well you're a lot better off than some people i mean some people are still learning how to take gels out of their pockets and drink out of the water bottle when they're riding their bike. So 
yeah, your steps from them. But. I managed to get some things down, but um, but when I first started riding, I couldn't do those things either. Like I was, uh, I think I could drink, I think I could take the water bottle out, but I remember like I was, when I first started riding, I was uncomfortable taking even one hand off the bike. Um, like I wanted to have yeah. two hands on the bike at all times. So it's like I was, I felt like unsteady if I was trying to reach for something in my pocket. Um, so, so yeah, I can, I, I can relate to those, to those issues also, but fortunately I've gotten past that. Um, yeah, that's, sorry to cut you off, but real quick, just, this is like, such. this is why I'm a huge advocate if you have the time to and I don't have the time to when school starts but in the summer I did but ride outside as much as you can because you're not going to learn any of those skills riding on a trainer you know yeah. either do I mean we don't do group rides we pretty much ride on our together or on our own but just work on those skills riding out the, outside because if you don't then you're going to struggle come race day and you don't know how to drink from a water bottle when you're going 40 miles per hour on a descent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, I think also as just speaking for myself, I don't know if, I don't know how joy feels about it, but you know, we've, we've both gotten faster as since the time that we started riding. And so I don't know if, it's also possible that, you know, going at faster speeds now, it becomes a little bit, uh, if you have, if you have any issues with bike handling, it's a little, it's, it's more exposed yeah. because well, when you're also, going at higher speeds. It's also a reaction time, right? Like if you're going at higher speeds, you have to react quickly to whatever all of a sudden comes at you. And, you know, if you don't react quick enough, then, or if you react in the wrong way, then it could, you know, be a disaster. Yeah, but I agree that um, riding indoors is, it can be great for for building fitness, but it doesn't, you know, you won't learn any skills riding the trainer. Um, and, and I was someone who, not that I, I, I've never preferred to ride the trainer, but I was always like content with, uh, you know, I'm just going to do all my weekday riding on the trainer because, you know, it's more convenient, um, you know, cause I have to work and everything like, like Joy was saying and, you know, then just do, you know, some longer outdoor rides on the weekend. But lately, um, this summer and I actually started doing this last year too um during the summer whenever it's you know the days are longer the, the days are long enough now where well of course they're starting to get shorter already but start in June the days get like pretty long and I'm able to to get in an outdoor ride before work you know this almost as easily as riding indoors as long as I um, the key is just to, you know, to set a few things aside and be prepared the day before so that I'm not like, um, not doing last minute preparations, uh, you know, the, the morning of, you know, have, have the, the, the kit set aside the, the day before and all that. But anyway, I've, I've been making a point of riding outside as much as possible and so that includes, you know, even like a one hour endurance ride on, on a weekday, or, you know, if I have a, a weekday workout, that's, you know, an hour, you know, an hour and 15 minutes or something, I'll try to do that outdoors as long as the, uh, you know, the, the terrain allows for it. And, um, pretty much whenever the weather permit permits, if it's not like a downpour, I've been making a point of riding exclusively outside during the summer. And, you know, I, I think that that's helped, uh, improve my handling. Um, cause like I said, I started doing that last year 
And I think my, my handling was actually getting like, you know, relatively okay up until, you know, I had the crash this year and I kind of backtracked and I kind of, um, you know, regressed a little bit, but I think my handling last year was, you know, probably better than it is right now. Oh, definitely. And I, but it wasn't always like that. It wasn't like that until I started doing a lot of outdoor riding. Um, so my point is, if you're someone that struggles with bike handling or any of this type of skills work, um, and if there's there's things about your outdoor rides that scare you, to be honest, there's really no easy way around it. You you have to face the fear and you have to get out there and, and ride more outside. Um, uh, you know, the, the more you ride outside, the more comfortable you're going to get with it. And eventually you can start chipping away at some of these skills and make small improvements. Uh, so, you know, for, for anyone that's, um, for anyone that struggles with, with bike handling, you know, I would, uh, based on my personal experience, I would recommend, when the weather allows for it, ride outside as much as you can, you know, until you get comfortable with it. I think it's that helped. Fear. It's it's helped me to address my fears. It's it's helped to do more outdoor riding, basically. Yeah, and fear does play a huge part on on how you ride. You know, I know that I can give one example of the time where I was like terrified. We were last year went on a, a weekend getaway to ride the Catskills, and we rode our uh, gravel bike. It was a couple of years ago. But oh, was it a couple of years ago? Yeah. Okay, we rode our gravel bike up the Minnewaska Preserve in the Shawangunk Mountains. I think that's how you say it. And there was a part where, as we were riding up to Minnewaska to see that there's this lake at the top. Um, there was this probably five foot wide trail, which was gravel, but it was loose gravel with loose stones. And on the right side is pretty much a cliff drop off. And I was terrified riding up it. I mean, it wasn't even that it was, it wasn't steep, but it was, you know, it was a, a gradual climb. And I was just terrified of climbing that. And just the fear like took over me. And we had to descend this. So we just decided to descend it on the road section. I, there was no way I was going to descend the um, on the gravel road. So we decided to send it on the pavement. And I was still like shaking. Like I couldn't even... I was afraid that I'm like, that's it. Like, I'm not going to get my descending skills back because I am now terrified. And I, we got out of the park fine. And then we had to descend back down to where we parked. And the descent on that one was also facing out. And you could see, you know, the towns of New Paltz and Gardner overlooking it. And it's just like, it's just terrifying. There was a switchback. And I almost, a part of me almost wanted to, start crying because how terrified I was. But yeah, if you're at that point where you're, you know, you're terrified, you're you have the fear that's, you know, it the fear that almost envelops you. It's like, what can you do but to freeze and not do anything? Your body just freezes up. So I mean, after that, I was fine. Um, I actually one way that I got through that was, well, I mean, it was still pretty scary descending it, but I didn't even think about that experience. I didn't even think about how afraid I was um, when I'm descending. You know, I don't even think about it. It's not really in my thought um, when I'm descending. I'm just in that moment. I'm not thinking of anything else, but making sure that, you know, I'm safe descending. So that f fear never lingered or like popped up on any future rides after that i definitely think that it will if we were to descend a road that is on a cliff like 
a cliff side because I'm just terrified of heights. Um, but I remembered when we descended Greylock, I was fine last year. You know, I was fine descending that. And that's probably because when we descended it, we were on the right side of the road closer. We weren't on the cliff side of the road, which is on the left to our left. Um, so I, it didn't really bother me. And also, as we got closer to the bottom, like the farther we away we got from the top, the it, it was more tree covered. And so the trees were um, pretty much covering the cliff side. So I wasn't really terrified of descending that. But it, I don't think it really, after, you know, doing a couple of rides after that, I'm not sure if it really lingered. Um, I actually didn't even think about it. Okay, that's good. So I guess maybe don't think, <laughs> maybe don't think about your crash. Uh, well, again, I did not you have didn't crash. That's the difference, right? Like the pain that you feel when you crash is probably lingering. Like you know exactly how it felt, and that was probably more memorable to you than the fear of falling off a cliff when it really didn't happen. It was all in my head. So maybe that's how, that's why I was able to get through that a little better than let's say if I did crash, which I hope never happens. Um, well, we've already spent a good amount of time talking about, um, you know, my, my skills issues and, you know, how I'm, I'm making a point of, of working on it. It's still, it's still a work in progress. So, um, maybe I'll give you another update in the future when I think I have things more nailed down. But I think the next thing that we wanted to talk about today was, um, Joy's experience working with a nutritionist. Um, cause this has been, I'm interested to hear everything that she has to tell you guys about this because, you know, she's, she's talked to me about, about it as she's gone through this process and you know i found it interesting some of the things that she's learned and um you know and just to see her interest in the topic well we could talk about it or do you do you want to talk about it now or we want to hold off on the next podcast um up to you i guess uh do, did you have a pretty good amount of uh um, information to go over sort of i yeah it's probably going to take another half hour. Um, we can do a separate podcast, maybe. Okay. Yeah, um, so maybe on the next episode, we will talk about um, my what I've learned so far um, with Jen Giles' program. And uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty interesting and eye-opening and definitely very informative. And uh, yeah, I'm learning a lot from that. So we'll talk about that the next time. All right, that's it? Yeah, I think that's it for today. All right. Thanks, guys. See you guys in the next episode. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Check out the links in the description to watch our tour of Litchfield Hills video recap. And if you'd like to donate to the Cancer Care Fund of Litchfield Hills, there's also a link to that as well. As always... Don't forget to enjoy the ride.